Hello all and welcome to our plenary session. My name is Kate Cleary and I'm the Director of Communications here at Adapt Community Network. We are excited for you to be joining us this year for our plenary session and an honor to announce this year's panelists. I am joined by Edward Matthews, Chief Executive Officer at Adapt Community Network, and he will be a panelist and a moderator for today's session. New York State Senator Brian Kavanaugh, representing the 26th Senate District covering Lower Manhattan and Western Brooklyn. And he is also the chair of the Senate Committee on Housing, Construction, and Community Development. New York State Senator Gustavo Rivera, representing the 33rd Senate District, covering the Northwest Bronx, and he is the chair of the Senate Health Committee. Assemblymember Karina Reyes, representing Assembly District 87, covering Park Chester and Castle Hill, and she is also a registered nurse who's been working the front lines supporting New Yorkers during COVID-19. Assemblymember Linda Rosenthal, representing the 67th Assembly District, which includes Upper West Side and parts of Hell's Kitchen in Manhattan. And she's also the chair of the Committee on Alcoholism and Drug Use. Thank you all so much for being here today and participating in our important discussion, addressing the needs of people with disabilities and providing insight and guidance for the year ahead. As I mentioned, our CEO, Edward Matthews, will be the moderator facilitating the discussion and highlighting current events and challenges that we are facing in the disability community. Since this year we are facilitating it virtually, we gathered some questions um, frequently asked by people supported and family members, uh, which we'll get into shortly. Uh, we do want to give the opportunity for our panelists to introduce themselves and give an opening statement. Uh, can we start with Senator Brian Kavanaugh? Yes, uh, it's great to be here. Um, and I'll, I'll keep this very brief, but just first of all, let me thank uh, DAPT and uh, Edward Matthews and uh, Catherine Cleary for uh, convening all of us today. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, you know, a great discussion. We have a uh, couple of my terrific colleagues uh, from Albany also joining. Um, and uh, you know, we've been working very hard, all of us in our various spheres to address uh, the very serious uh, challenges that have come with the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, obviously it's a public health crisis, but also an economic crisis and a housing crisis and really something that challenges all of our systems and, and has laid bare some of the um, kind of deficiencies in the way we do things in normal times. And obviously th these are extreme circumstances. So we know a lot of people have been through a lot. We're working to address that. And you know, I look forward to a great conversation today. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Gustavo Rivera. Good afternoon or good morning or whenever it is that you're going to see it. Uh, Gustavo Rivera again, State Senator for the 33rd District in the Northwest Bronx, Chair of the Health Committee and actually neighbor to ADAPT. Uh, although we don't uh, go to the offices that often, right? But my district office is a 2432 Grand Concourse and ADAPT has two floors there. So we have been, my office has been, uh, has had a great relationship with the organization for a few years and I am very Glad to be here, uh, glad to answer any and all of your questions. And if you are a resident of the Northwest Bronx, remember that if you know where the ADAPT offices are on 2432 Grand Concourse, so 187th in the concourse, on the fifth floor is my office. So if you are in the Bronx, that is, I, we work for you. So although we're doing virtual hours now, that is where my office is. So hopefully I'll get to see and meet some of you at some point. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you. And Assemblymember Karina Sorias. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, Azab, Edward, and Catherine again for convening us and my colleagues in government for helping um, have this very important conversation. Um, I represent the 87th Assembly District here in the Bronx. Um, I'm an RN and a mom of two boys. Uh, and Azab uh, has um, dealt with a lot of the issues that not just my constituents face, but that I have uh, lived in my professional career. And I have a, a, a lot of respect for the work that they do, um, particularly now when they are really striving to, to meet um, the, the gaps um, that have been um, laid out by, by the current pandemic. Um, and I think it's our responsibility, not just to have these conversations, but to figure out solutions 
for the population that ADAPT serves. So thank you again for this conversation. So I'm Assembly Member Linda B. Rosenthal. I represent the 67th Assembly District, as you said, Upper West Side, parts of Hell's Kitchen. Um, I've been in the Assembly 14 years and um, I'm chair of the Committee on Alcoholism and Drug Abuse. Um, I like to pass legislation. So I've passed uh, more than 120 laws so far. And they, they range from um, bills in the alcoholism and, and drug abuse sphere to housing, on domestic violence, on animal cruelty, environmental issues, um, and everything in between. Um, I'm happy to be here with you uh, discussing uh, ADAPT Community Network today. And um, I know that with the COVID-19 pandemic, people who already have challenges in life are facing even more. So it's a very important uh, discussion and thank you for convening it and inviting me. Thank you. And uh, I, will, I will give it over to Edward Matthews, our CEO. Thank Thanks, you. Kate. I'd like to thank all of the uh, esteemed members of our state legislature who have uh, uh, joined us here this morning. And uh, there are about 400 people registered for this conference so that uh, hopefully we'll be able to address some of the issues that, uh, that you're most concerned about as well as, and Kate will tell you later how to get some of your questions in later on that we will all be able to, uh, to answer for you. So uh, with that, I wanted to thank all the members of the, all of you for registering and being with us today. Uh, it's my privilege to have been the CEO here for the past 31 years. And um, I also spend time in state government. And so, uh, as you know, we have a lot of challenges and parents and, and family members of both uh, children and adults uh, have been uh, affected disproportionately, I think, by the pandemic as, as well as uh, some of our other folks out there in terms of housing and education and certainly healthcare. Uh, as you know, ADAPT has uh, done a lot of work in housing. Uh, we do a lot of housing assistance and uh, we, have, uh, we do renovations for uh, apartments, not only in NYCHA housing, but in, uh, for people so that folks can stay in their home and find uh, easier ways to get in and out of their apartments and homes. And, and we thank uh, Senator Kavanaugh for his leadership uh, in, in housing. Uh, our office, uh, our main office at 80 Maiden Lane is in the district there. So we, uh, we, we touch everybody here. So uh, uh, Senator, one of the, obviously one of the things that uh, uh, families are most concerned about is um, what, what resources are available for folks in, uh, in, in looking for low income housing or affordable housing uh, in, uh, in, in around the city and around the state? Uh, it's, a great, it's a great question and one we get from you know, many people very frequently and I think all of our offices um, and it is a challenge. Uh, the programs that, prov that are sort of formally subsidized uh, by federal, state, and city resources are typically run by the city. Uh, so HPD, uh, this, you know, the City Housing Preservation Development uh, Department is the principal uh, kind of organizer of that information around new developments that are coming on. Uh, they have, uh, they run lotteries for, for housing developments that one can sign up for. Um, and uh, they also have uh, various resources to assist people in looking for housing in, uh, uh, you know, advice about, about how to, um, you know, how to identify potential places where you could live. Um, having said that, it is very challenging. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we have a very, very tight housing market. Um, one of the things we did last year uh, was uh, pass laws, the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act, which is intended to, uh, prevent the deregulation of, of thousands and thousands of units that had been deregulated over many years and was reducing the supply of affordable housing each year. So we're hoping that going forward, as we develop new affordable housing, the overall stock of affordable housing will increase because in past years, as we built new housing, it was the, any gains were offset by the losses of affordable housing in the, in the rent stabilization program. Um, you also should, you know, each of you, you, you have an assembly member and two senators on here, but each of you has local elected officials and you should reach out to them directly uh, to their offices. They may know of developments that are coming on. We do get notices of things that are happening and you can reach out to them as well directly. Um, if you go to who represents me uh, NYC, 
Uh, if you just Google that, you'll get a thing that'll tell you all of your city and state and federal reps. And it's worth reaching out to their offices and asking that question locally as well. Um, but it is, uh, again, I also would, we probably get into this in a little bit, but I also would note that there are specific rights that people uh, with disabilities have with respect to housing that may, uh, that you should, you should be aware of as you're looking. But I think I'll turn back to, if you want to. No, I think, uh, Senator, I think that's one of the questions that we get frequently from, from family members and our information uh, and our resource lines is what are, what, what rights do tenants in, um, in uh, both, uh, in public, uh, publicly assisted housing have, and you just mentioned uh, a new law that passed the Tenant Protection Act, as well as some of the other things you touched on. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so you, the, under federal, state, and city law, it is illegal to discriminate against people in housing based on a disability or a perceived disability. Um, that includes uh, in rental housing, it also includes uh, in, in uh, home, you know, in home ownership. Uh, we have been in recent months doing hearings on Long Island uh, regard it in response to Newsday. Uh, the newspaper did a, a great piece that it focused, focused mostly on racial and ethnic discrimination. But what became clear is that there's a lot of discrimination going on, a lot of behavior that seems explicitly illegal. Um, and so we are now working to address, we're working on a package of legislation to, to strengthen the ability of government to respond to discrimination that's going on, including working with the attorney general's office. Um, but if you believe you're experiencing discrimination, the attorney general is one option, the state attorney general, Tish James, uh, but the city and the state uh, divisions of, how, of uh, human rights also will enforce the housing laws. And again, it is absolutely illegal to be discriminated against based on a disability. Um, you also have a right to request an accommodation. Request uh, I, an accommodation can be something that the landlord changes their policies, the way they, you know, operate the building. Uh, they can, for example, you could example, for example, request that rent bills get sent to, a, you know, a third party if, if there's somebody that helps you. Uh, you know, keep your bills current. You could also request physical modifications to your apartment. Unfortunately, under current law, the landlord does not necessarily have an obligation to pay for uh, changes to the physical changes to the apartment. Um, they can make the case that it's too expensive for them. And that's a sort of a decision that's made case by case. But as uh, Matthew noticed up front, there are organizations, including ADAPT, that will assist people in uh, adding, uh, you know, various accommodations and making changes to apartments to, um, uh, you know, to, to help accommodate you. I mean, I just realized, I think I just called you Matthew and I meant Edward, <laughs> sorry. That's quite all right. <laughs> As Mr. Matthews uh, mentioned up front. <laughs> um, but, uh, but uh, you know, so, so you, you do have rights. And again, I also would say that we do, we have had situations where we have advocated directly for our constituents when a landlord is, um, you know, saying that they can't accommodate somebody, we will, we will push hard for that to happen as well. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that, Senator, because as I mentioned early on, we do get, uh, we, we've been fortunate in our, uh, in, our in, in some of our programs to have uh, 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 grants from both the New York State Division of Housing and Renewal, as well as the New York State Health Department, Senator Rivera, uh, from uh, on their nursing home diversion program that we've been able to access funds virtually every year for, uh, of course it is income dependent, but uh, for, for folks who are in both public housing and supported housing and um, even who live privately who meet the income requirements to be able to uh, do modifications. And landlords have been generally uh, pretty good about that. Uh, you know, so, and uh, certainly the city and any of the other uh, public housing has been very good about it so that we can widen doorways, bathrooms, do accessibility, widen doorways and bedrooms. and allow for wheelchairs and better access through the apartment. And in some cases, we've been able to put uh, ramps and everything on some of the, some of the housing so that uh, people can access the community as well. So um, we thank you for your leadership on all of that. Uh, uh, we do have, I do have another question. You know, the uh, uh, ADAPT and some other agencies in the city have worked um, somewhat successfully and unsuccessfully with some of the developers who do supported housing here in the city of New York and throughout the state. <laughs> and one of the things that um, uh, I, I am sad to tell you is that although there have been set-asides for, uh, for people who, uh, you know, for, for, those, for some groups, uh, 
the way that the New York State Office of People with Developmental Disabilities has uh, has allocated money, there has never been a successful supported housing program with a set aside for people with developmental disabilities done in the city of New York. It seems strange to seems strange to them. It, uh, it it surprises them that the cost of doing development housing development in New York City exceeds the cost of doing the housing development in Utica. So they uh, they try to uh, they try. They try to make those allocations based on some of the upstate costs. So I guess it's not a question, but an encouragement for uh, you as the chair and your committee to work with OPWDD in the coming years to find, to help them find ways to make uh, better accommodations for us to work with developers in the city who've been very willing, but right. we've been unable to, to match some of the costs that we're able to do in other, in other areas of the state. So as, as, you know, as group homes and things like that, and the capital for those are going to dry up. I think the supported housing is one of the ways in which um, families and people are going to find housing and independent housing in the future. So I'm encouraging the committee to work with us and OPW to to make better allocations for uh, set aside for people with developmental disabilities. Good. Yeah. No. And I let me just just respond. I would say that you know we, it, this is a good moment to be having the conversation because we are coming to the end of the governor's uh, previous five year plan for. Uh, affordable housing, including supportive housing. And uh, we are going to be having negotiations about what the next five years look like. And we've been pushing for uh, greater funding for supportive housing for, to accelerate the rate at which the state pr produces uh, affordable uh, supportive housing units. Uh, so we should have this conversation about whether the um, the formulas, for, you know, the cost formulas and, and limitations need to be adjusted to reflect the higher cost of the city, because everybody knows that uh, costs here are much higher in, in vir virtually every aspect. Um, if I could mention one other thing before we go on, I, I, I probably sh should have mentioned this up front, but one other resource that people should be aware of if you're a renter uh, is the, the, the DREE program and the SCREE program. These are programs that will freeze your rent if you're rent stabilized or in certain other developments where the increases in rents are limited, um, like uh, some of the you know, uh, well, they're very, they're very. If you are, if you are a renter, you should be looking into whether you qualify for uh, the disabled rent increase exemption program, and uh, or the senior citizen rent increase exemption program. Um, e in each of those programs, we raised the income limits a few years ago so that you can be making currently up to fifty thousand dollars household income. Uh, there are, uh, there are currently the head of household uh, needs to be either sixty two years old for degree or. Uh, experiencing a disability uh, for DREE. Um, but these are programs that will freeze your rent uh, indefinitely where it is, and the landlord is compensated through a property tax break. Um, they're, they're somewhat popular programs, but we know that many, many people who qualify have not applied for them. Similarly, if you're a homeowner and you have a relatively low income, you can get uh, property tax exemptions through a, a companion program called uh, the Disabled Homeowner uh, Exemption uh, so that's uh, sometimes called D, but you should look into those and see if uh, you are eligible and certainly, certainly apply if you are. Of course, the governor has extended, I think, some of the uh, freezing of rents and the uh, forgiveness of rent payments during the pandemic uh, up till I forget now what the, uh, what his latest date is on, on the emergency, but uh, people should still be able to take advantage of that as well, especially those who have uh, lost their job through the through the uh, through this period. Yeah, we we've worked very hard to make sure that there is an eviction moratorium in place. Uh, that has been there's been a complete moratorium uh, in place uh, since the middle of March, which my colleagues and I, including my colleagues on the phone today, uh, pushed very hard uh, to get. Um, and this, the current situation has gotten a little complicated. Uh, the governor has extended, has issued an order that's extended through December 31st. We're still waiting to see whether the courts are gonna interpret it as a complete moratorium on evictions. Um, and, but at this point, if you're experiencing a financial hardship, it is clear you cannot be evicted anywhere in New York State through the end of this year. And again, that's something we've extended periodically. Uh, we've also been looking to do that, let, to do something even stronger legislatively. And uh, Karinas Reyes, who's on here on the call, is one of the great leaders in the assembly on that issue. Uh, there's a couple of bills that, that I sponsor, uh, that I've been supporting and trying to push along with my colleagues in the assembly uh, to extend that. Um, it should be noted that if you can't, it is not a rent holiday. Um, so if you can pay rent, you still have an obligation to pay your rent. 
Um, and you know, there may be consequences if you don't. So uh, if you can pay your rent, you should continue to do so. But if you can't and you're suffering uh, a hardship uh, and you can't pay your, and you're having difficulty, you should contact your landlord and tell them that. And at, at present, uh, you can't be evicted for that reason. Thank you very much, Senator Kavanaugh. I think it's very helpful. And uh, as I said, folks on the, who are listening to this uh, panel discussion will send in some other questions. So uh, Kate will probably be back to you <laughs> shortly for some, uh, for some clarification as people have some, some questions that some of this conversation and this discussion have spurred them for. So thanks very much. My pleasure, and, great. Uh, Senator Rivera, who is our chair of our health committee in the Senate. Uh, you know, the, the biggest question I think that folks have uh, is all about Medicaid and Medicaid eligibility. So uh, uh, rather than be specific, I'll just throw that whole issue to you and find out, you know, <laughs> how people get that, eligible that and what tiny, your office can do to help. That it's tiny a tiny little general issue. Before we do that, I actually would want to give an opportunity to, to, to Assemblyman Reyes, since she is the sponsor of that bill on the housing bill over in the assembly. Uh, I did, I did want to give Please her an do. opportunity before Please so do. that she can talk a little bit about the bill and she, the work she's doing over there. Cause, cause Brian is right. She's definitely been one of the big leaders over there. And I just wanted to give her an opportunity before we move on to Medicaid, if we, if we can. Very fair. Assembly member Reyes. Sure. Um, so at first I want to thank uh, Senator Kavanaugh for um, mentioning our, our legislation. So there have been uh, numerous measures put in place by the governor via executive order to extend, to create a, a moratorium, but it's not really truly a moratorium. What it is is an affirmative defense in court that um, somebody has been unable to pay rent because of COVID related reasons and therefore not be able to be, not start an eviction proceeding. But currently um, the housing courts are open and the landlord can still place a money judgment on unpaid rent, uh, which can potentially mean that you're not evicted now, but when the, the moratorium is lifted, uh, you could potentially uh, start eviction proceedings. Um, and that could be as early as next month. And we know that we are still currently in the middle of, of a pandemic and a crisis. So I introduced a piece of legislation uh, al along with Senator Myrie in the Senate that would create a blanketed eviction moratorium for a year after the state of emergency is lifted. That would be extended as well to commercial tenants, um, uh, uh, individual tenants, and it's also an eviction on for, um, a moratorium on foreclosures. Um, and we believe this would be a true eviction moratorium because currently, um, if you are unable to, to use that affirmative defense, a lot of tenants, particularly in upstate regions, don't have uh, a right to counsel. Um, so they are, uh, don't have the ability to use that affirmative defense in housing court. Uh, it's easier for New York City residents to take advantage of that because there is um, right to counsel in the city uh, in housing court. So we want to make sure that everybody throughout the state is really uh, covered and, and that we're not evicting people in the middle of a pandemic where having a place to live and having a place to quarantine is, is uh, paramount in helping stop the spread of, of, the, of the COVID-19. I wanted to make sure- Thank you. Yeah, just- I know just, that you're the moderator. I know that you're the moderator. I respect the no, moderator. No, no, no. I, I, but I want you guys to, I, I, I think the, the value of this is to have a free and open discussion. So please do. Yeah, because I'm, I'm going to talk over Gustavo now just to, <laughs> because I've learned that from presidential debates. But no, just to say um, that, you know, just for clarity, there are two pieces of legislation. And I like, uh, you know, Senator Ray is, uh, is, is the sponsor of one of them with Senator Myrie, and I have a bill also. We, I support both of them. And I, 100% agree we need, the, we need the legislature to step up and make sure there is a moratorium in place as long as is necessary to prevent people uh, from getting evicted as a result of uh, the COVID-19 crisis. We got to, you know, in these dark times, we do our best to keep it light while providing good, solid information like my two colleagues did. And as a parenthesis on the housing issue, it has been consistently an issue the bet the, the, the the biggest issue in my constituency, basically for the entire time that I've been in the Senate. And so this is 
people were in crisis before the crisis. So I'm, I'm very, very, I, I joined my two colleagues and I'm, uh, I'm fighting along with them to make sure that we can make this into a reality so we protect people. It was, it was very good to do it last year when it related to uh, extending the laws, protecting tenants. We did a hell of a job last year in being able to do that. And we need to do work this year to protect people who find themselves in weird situations because of the Rona. Now, you asked about uh, Medicaid. The, um, I'm, feeling, the I'm feeling like Chris Wallace here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Again, I respect the moderator. I respect the moderator. Anyway, you asked yeah, about, uh, you know, as, as you ahead. know, uh, New York is one of the states, uh, fortunately, that under the Affordable Care Act has expanded Medicaid. Uh, for folks, but still there's a lot of confusion, Senator, about how you qualify for Medicaid, where you can go, and, and how uh, both families, uh, what, you know, there are families with deemed income and not deemed income and certain, certain waivers for that. So, I mean, just generally speaking, what's the best way for people to start to, to get, to find out the best way to, for eligibility and how they can qualify? And then I'll have a follow-up to that after, and gotcha. after you talk about that bit. So the best way to determine that eligibility, I would say one of the things that you can do is you can certainly work through the offices of the of your local representatives. We work along with uh, uh, as, as well as identifying the federally qualified health centers or FQHCs in your neighborhood. I mean, I'll talk, for example, in the Northwest Bronx, whether it's Union Community Health Center or Morris Heights Health Center, both of those folks are, are open to community members coming in and asking these questions. During these times, you'll definitely get the, you'll get like, I went to, um, I went to my dentist appointment the other day at Union Community Health Center, and they have like a little monitor so that you, you uh, it's a TV, it's like a little screen and you put your face on it and then it measures your temperature. So you definitely will have to do that. But that is the best way to actually talk to someone that can actually ask you all the questions that are necessary to determine about your eligibility. Because in the state of New York, we have the essential plan, which is something that we expanded Medicaid in the state of New York a few years ago, which means that you have, uh, it costs much less than other health plans, offers the same essential benefits. You can enroll online, actually, uh, but, it, but, but going to an office, I know that, or, or talking to somebody on the phone who's knowledgeable about this, I know is usually the best way. So either reach out to your local elected's office. If you are in the Northwest Bronx, certainly reach out to me. And we have many of our, you know, most of our colleagues, I will not speak for all of them, but most of our colleagues certainly will have the information that you need to be able to be eligible, to determine eligibility. And your local FQHCs, federally qualified health centers, would certainly be able to help you fully to determine your eligibility. Assemblymember Reyes, you're a health professional. Is there anything you'd like to weigh in on, on, on just talking about that through your office as well? I second what Gustavo said. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to interrupt on another housing issue earlier, but I restrained myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. look, Medicaid, Medicaid has been something that uh, is proven to be a true safety net for so many people. Um, and we also have to be mindful that uh, during the pandemic, a lot of our um, H and H facilities and public health facilities have really taken a hit because they have been serving people who otherwise would not be interacting with the healthcare system. Um, but because of of the current health crisis, um, they've seen an increase in in services. Um, and I I think it's important that as a state we continue to do everything we can to make sure that that they are well funded because they are truly um, the safety net for our city and our state. Thank you. Uh, one of the, one of the, the, for a lot of our folks, you know, they, they're in that, they're in that no man's land where, you know, they're not eligible for Medicaid and yet do not have health insurance through employer or other things. And, and, and so I guess uh, as long as we have it, what the advantages that the Affordable Care Act or other, uh, other options that they may have to pursue and to try to get health care for themselves and their children, even though, they may not be right now qualified for Medicaid. Well, one quick thing that I'll say about this is that we actually, there's a piece of legislation that, I, that I've introduced that would actually expand the essential plan, particularly during the crisis, during the pandemic, extending the essential plan uh, for, uh, for undocumented people. Since there are undocumented folks 
that because they are undocumented, they, they have certainly access to emergency care, but they don't have access to primary care. They don't have uh, an insurance product. I will, so we did that. And there is another bill, which is the, the, the gold standard, which we are fighting for. Uh, and I know that we're going to talk about advocacy. So I would actually encourage everyone who cares about providing, making sure that everyone has access to health care, not just access to health care, but that has guaranteed health care. In the state of New York, there's a bill called the New York Health Act, which actually would create a single payer system in the state of New York. And a simple way to think about it is guaranteed health care for every New Yorker. Uh, and there's, and we could talk about, you know, we could go into it more deeply, but the bottom line is that uh, we, we rec- there's many of us that recognize that there are, there, even in a state like New York that did expand Medicaid, that has an essential plan, there's other states in which such things don't exist, uh, and, and in which uh, the majority of people have some type of insurance, that does not guarantee you care, uh, and we need to do better. Uh, and for folks who are developmentally disabled or for folks who are undocumented, folks who are on the margins and vulnerable, we need to do more to make sure that there's access to care and that they have guaranteed access to it. So that we're working on that as well. The New York State Health Act, which is, a, like you said, a single payer system, I guess that's to sort of smooth out the inequities between the Medicaid, Medicare and private insurance payments that go. So uh, yep. tell us a little bit more about where that is and what we could do to find out more about that and uh, try to do some advocacy because there, there are other people looking for an all payer system, which it comes down to about the same thing. But but uh, tell us a little bit for all of you what, what that would mean and, and how we could do some advocacy around that. Well, for, thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to do that. Now, again, so the New York Health Act is a piece of legislation that would guarantee care for every single New Yorker. And that means regardless of age, gender, uh, or immigration status, or wealth. Uh, and it would indeed equalize the system. And you might ask yourself, like, how, how does this thing, how would it actually work? Now it's called a single payer system because right now we have a multi-payer system. What that means is that when you go to your doctor, the payment that that doctor gets could come from a whole bunch of different places. It could come from private insurance, it could come from your pocket, it could come from Medicare, come from Medicaid, et cetera. But a single payer system means that the state of New York would be the one paying the bills. It does not impact outside of providing, making sure that you have access to to, to the provider that you choose it doesn't impact the decisions that are made between you and your doctor. Unlike now when you have insurance companies whose job it is not to guarantee you care, but to guarantee themselves a profit. Uh, So that is, we want to move away from that. And this bill, uh, it has 31 sponsors in the state Senate. Um, We have, that is almost the majority of the state Senate. We have a body of 62. So we would need one more to have a majority in the Senate. Uh, That, Still, we are still working on tweaking the bill to make sure that we can address concerns and legitimate concerns that have been brought up about how the, how the, the, the bill is organized, how it would work. Uh, but I think that what this crisis has demonstrated is so clearly that the systems that are meant to protect us do not protect us. Uh, the, the lack of access to, to preventive care, just to pick one thing out of the hat, since there is there's a lot of folks who don't have access to primary care, who don't actually go and take care of a situation like a chronic disease in a regular basis because they don't have the ability to because their insurance doesn't cover it or because this person is out of network, et cetera. By, by smoothing that out, as you said, Ed, uh, Mr. Matthews, I was just going to call you Ed. And I'm like, Ed's I, fine. I know Ed's the fine. dude, but I know you that well. I don't know if Ed is, is, is permissible, but, but, it, but so, so smoothing out the system means actually securing primary care for everyone, providing preventive care, preventative care for everybody. And if you have someone who have chronic conditions that that identifies earlier, that means that you can actually manage that condition and you both feel better, have better health and cost the system less. So, uh, and, and so this is one of the many things that we want to do with this. And the way that you can, you can actually get involved if you go um, to, 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 if you Google New York Health Act, so just New York Health Act, you will be, you will be able to go to a website called Campaign for New York Health. There you will find all the information about 
how the bill is organized. How, well, you, you can read the bill if you want to read the technical aspects of it, but read studies that have been made to show you how it, it actually saves us money. Um, and you can actually find all the information in one place. So if you Google campaign for New York health, you can add yourself. And by the way, one of the important things that we know is going to get us over the hump of being able to pass this bill are the stories of people all over the state. Even people who are insured, I am sure, have many stories that show the, the inefficiencies of the current system or the messed upness, to not use harsher language, of the current system. And those stories, you can actually share them with us and we can then tell them to other people and say like, do you really wanna defend the system in which these are the things that happen? We can do better, we must do better. And I believe that with the New York Health Act, we can. And the reason that I wanted to ask all of you is that, you know, for, for children and adults with developmental disabilities, we've done so much in terms of finding equality, yet at the same time, so many of our folks still have so much difficulty accessing, uh, you know, good health care. I mean, there, there, you know, we have more and more dual eligibles now who have uh, Medicare as also their primary, their primary health care coverage, and that, that gets you better access than, than Medicaid does. But at the same time, it's still it's still a major problem for folks. And as you pointed out, Senator, the FQHCs, the Federally Qualified Health Centers, have done a marvelous job in, uh, in providing uh, comprehensive health care for people. And, you know, they still have, uh, there are more and more of them now throughout the city and throughout the state that we've been able to find. But uh, Assemblymember Reyes, you're also a health professional. So I think one of the things I'd like to ask you to do is just talk about some of the, some of the things that your office has been trying to do to help people get better health care in your, in your district and throughout uh, and some of the committee work you've done. Sure. Um, so I, first I want to say, I, I have to thank Senator Rivera for his advocacy with the New York Health Act. One of the things that actually got me involved in politics was um, my advocacy work around the New York Health Act as, a, as an RN. And it's not just a compassionate thing for us to do to ensure that everybody in our state is covered, but it just makes financial sense. Because if you think about it, there is so much overhead um, in these multi-billion dollar insurance companies. They have to pay senior management. They have to pay CEOs. These are millions and millions of dollars that are taken off the top that of of our healthcare system that could really go into addressing the needs of the people um, and are being uh, used to line the pockets of, of CEOs and, and upper management and, and countless insurance companies, because we don't just have one or two, we have dozens and dozens of insurance companies in New York state that are used, that are being used to manage um, uh, federal dollars and state dollars for health insurance. Um, but, you know, some of the things that we've been doing um, uh, in my office and legislatively is, is supporting the work of, of our health chairs and, and, and trying to find ways to um, extend uh, some of our social services and, and dollars. One, one of the things that we looked to do um, was uh, extend uh, SNAP benefits uh, during this time which we know is the safety net beneath the safety net um, for many people who are struggling um, during, during this time. Uh, and, and it would allow individuals to use um, their SNAP benefits to buy hot meals because many individuals who are either seniors or disabled, um, unfortunately are unable to prepare their own meals, which means that they are subjected to either uh, eating things that are frozen or super preserved, all these things that affect health because they are preserved with either high sugar or high salt um, and, and creates this um, catalyst uh, snowball effect in their, in their health outcomes. So we've been looking at ways to address those little issues that we know have overall health outcome um, effects on, on individuals' health outcomes. Um, and that's one of the things we've been doing legislatively and pushing legislatively. Another thing uh, that we were doing in regards, I'm going back to this housing thing, was the uh, uh, Senator Kavanaugh uh, mentioned for Scree and Dree how there are um, something over 50% of the people who qualify for it don't apply for it. Um, and, and one thing that we did was introduce legislation to uh, create automatic enrollment into Scree and Dree programs for people who qualify. So they don't have to go to their legislators or look for a program that can help freeze their rent um, if they need it. 
And uh, for members of the audience, our own uh, Project Connect will have more information about that as we as we roll out here as well. So that uh, uh, we're not we're not done with Medicaid and long term care yet. But I'm going to come back to that because it's a uh, it's the uh, it's the 800 pound gorilla here for uh, for all of us providers and uh, and uh, families and individuals uh, who receive services through the New York State Office of People with Developmental Disabilities. We're going to come back to that. Assembly Member Rosenthal, let me turn to you. Uh, as you said, you're the chair of the Committee on uh, Alcoholism and Drug Abuse. And uh, uh, in our audience today, as I've mentioned, there are over 400 folks, parents, family members, uh, care coordinators, service coordinators, and providers uh, providing services primarily to those uh, New Yorkers with developmental disabilities. But over the past decade or so, uh, we have found more and more folks uh, who, with these challenges still come with other issues such as alcoholism and substance abuse. And I'd like to turn to you and talk to about what parents who, with, with kids and adults who are not yet in the system where we can, we, we know them and have other services, um, where they, who they might turn to to find supports for, uh, for, for their children, for themselves, or even some of the people in their own family that are not developmentally disabled who are facing some, some challenges, as you said, especially now when people are so isolated. Right. Well, you know, that is a great challenge. And as uh, parents and family members already know that they are their own best advocates and um, they're the ones who are the most aggressive, but it's because they have to be. And it's the system is not set up to be easy to navigate. So <clears throat> that's one of the first things I learned uh, when I took this office is that um the ones out there advocating do it because not enough attention and resources are devoted to their particular area of interest. So in schools, for example, <clears throat> I know that, you know, there are many challenges um, that, that students face and schools need to be working better with families uh, to support people with, with uh, needs. For example, um, people with um, IEPs, et cetera, um, had trouble um, accessing the iPads that were given out to every student across the city. And so <clears throat> that was, that was a, a, a problem. Um, many, many did not receive those. So parents and others had to advocate and electeds like me had to in also advocate for them, say you can't leave kids behind just because it's harder maybe to uh, to reach them or engage with them and, and to provide the services they need, even though remotely it's extra hard. Um, I mean, there are state agencies that support um, children's behavioral health, like uh, the Office of Mental Health, the Department of Health, OPWDD, um, OCFS, they all work in tandem and families can contact those agencies or, you know, on their websites, it should be, um, they're, there are links to various um, services, but I find it best to pick up the phone and, and try to reach people in person. But there are a panoply of services. You just have to look hard to find them. Um, and I, I think always relying on some of the uh, groups and agencies such as ADAPT to actually you, you've already all been through it. You have the resources that you can recommend. So that's, that's a, another thing that can, that can happen. But people certainly should call their electeds and ask them to help navigate the system. Thank you. Yes, we would, I'll put in a plug for us. Yes, we have our Project Connect, which does do just that, connect people with services, even if they're not our own, but try to get people the resources throughout the city that, that, that they have. So thank you for that. And sure. thank you for all your good work on behalf of so many families. Uh, Assembly Member Reyes, uh, as a member of the Education Committee, I mean, right now, uh, you know, we have a, a disconnected a system as we could possibly find uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, you know, just more and more now, school school districts are are uh, throughout the state are closing. Individual schools are closing, and one of the things that we're finding is that. Uh, where, where people can get assistance, getting the tools and supplies that they need to have remote learning. You know, for many of our folks, uh, for many of our folks, they have uh, limited access to, uh, to the kinds of tablets. And I know every education provider is trying to help 
but uh, it's been very difficult for them through the New York City DOE particularly to access the necessary uh, supplies to be able to handle remote learning. So I'm wondering if you could sort of comment on that and things that uh, they, places they might go and how they, how they might get some of these things. Sure. Um, so uh, first I have to say remote learning has been a challenge. It's a challenge for um, children that don't have um, and don't struggle with disabilities. And it's a struggle for parents as well. Um, I ha I'm a mom of two boys who are right now in the process of remote learning and it has been extremely difficult. Um, so the, the, the New York City Department of Education and the individual schools are responsible for ensuring that every child has at least a device needed to participate in remote learning. Um, and the New York City DOE did put out a survey that they encouraged every parent to fill out so they can keep track of um, how many devices they needed to purchase. And we, we did see early on in March when schools initially closed that there were students who didn't have um, the necessary technology to participate in, in remote learning. They have been saying that that has gotten better um, because they had the summer to, to make sure that they uh, ordered enough equipment. So every, according to the, the, the information from the Department of Education, every child has been issued um, some kind of device. The ones, the tablets that come from the DOE are LTE enabled, which means that they have some kind of um, uh, uh, wireless connectivity where they can access the internet. Um, for those individuals that are having trouble with Wi-Fi, I know that um, um, Optimum, uh, Charter, Spectrum, Verizon all have some sort of uh, low-cost Wi-Fi. Um, most of them require you to be a New York City resident, and if you uh, participate in the free school lunch program, that automatically enables you to receive this reduced rate. Um, or if you are a recipient of SSI benefits, you're able to uh, receive these reduced rates from a lot of um, internet providers to be able to access Wi-Fi because that has been um, one of the biggest challenges is having the device and not being able to connect. Well, thank you. Uh, Assembly Member Rosenthal, let me turn to you. I wanted to know if there's anything else you'd like our families and people to know about the things that your office can do and how you, and uh, especially for those who live in the district. Mm -hmm. And uh, the things that uh, you get uh, some legislation you're currently working on, uh, hopefully that would uh, that would benefit families and people with substance abuse, mental health problems, or anything else. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I, I as I said in the beginning, I try to work on lots of uh, broad uh, based issues, but some legislation I'm working on, which I think is is pertinent to anyone with any medical issues, is telehealth. And so um, during the special session, I passed a, a law that um, would allow audio only to be reimbursed um, for telehealth because it was only video. And many people don't have access to uh, computers or smartphones or phones. And, you know, we need to do smartphones. We need to allow audio as well. And, and Especially that, for mental health counseling and uh, abuse counseling and so exactly. forth. That's uh, all, of, all of the, if you can see all the members out there, they'd be smiling right now. That's a very good point. <laughs> good. Yeah, that's very important. Um, and, I, and I have another bill that would, um, you know, doctors, doctors are some shy about embracing telehealth for fear that they will not be reimbursed properly. And their time is their time. So half an hour in the office or half an hour on the computer or on the phone, maybe it's the same thing to them in terms of billing. So trying to cre create an equitable system for telehealth. And the fact is that, you know, we were moving in that direction increasingly, but COVID-19, which kept us all inside, has just, um, you know, in it, it sped up that process. So I think we have to deal with rules and regs and reimbursements and all those policies now rather than down the road. And I know yeah, that- Yeah, especially now since the Medicare exem you know, exemption for all of that, at least through the crisis, has been extended by the Trump administration now, at least through 20, March of 21. But yes. I do think this needs to be a permanent part of our, of our service delivery for sure. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I have, I have bills about- um, you know, making uh, medication-assisted treatment easier for people to access. 
Um, so someone who has um, alcohol or drug issues and says, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready now. I need, a, I need buprenorphine. Um, it shouldn't be that hard to access it. It should be like on demand and we need more doctors with waivers to be present across the state. Um, and we need it available readily. Also, the initiation into buprenorphine, uh, the feds gave a waiver that you don't have to be in a doctor's office, you can be elsewhere to start it. So that's another important thing I'm pushing for. Um, also, unfortunately, on the, on the drug uh, use uh, area, uh, the Department of Health has to put out quarterly reports that, that reveal the numbers of overdose, et cetera. And the State Department of Health has not updated the numbers this entire year for this year. Um, how can you diagnose and treat a problem if you don't know where it is? And I'm, I'm you know, I'm quite angry about it. And uh, that's a, you know, I understand everybody's involved with COVID, but uh, COVID has- well, they, weren't, they weren't that great with that either. I mean, we had to really form our own coalition to put our own COVID numbers together. And the really? state office, State Department of Health and OPWDD were asking us for our numbers so that they could update their own their exactly. own uh, statistics. So, so who you know, if you if you have that responsibility, maybe they should give you the reins and you can run the show. Well, you that know, uh, uh, there are those of us who believe that the uh, provider-led managed care is the way to go for long-term care and integrated health. So, we're glad we may have a champion here for that. Okay, as, yes. uh, as we move along, for all of you, the the food insecurity has become such a a problem for a lot of folks who have been just disconnected from their pay, from their work and from everything else. Can you, can you all comment on some of the ways in which they can uh, find some help for, for, uh, for those families that are really going, who are really having trouble, uh, you know, access, especially a lot of our folks with disabilities who are having trouble um, accessing nutritious food. So uh, especially during the pandemic and most, a lot of agencies, including ours are helping out with that, but, there's still so many people that are falling through the cracks with that. So I might, we have a lot of uh, not only family members, but care managers from the care coordination organizations here. We have uh, representatives of the DOE and other people on the, on the line here viewing this. So you might want you just comment on, on some of the ways in which uh, uh, they, can, they can access better uh, access to food security. I know I've talked about this before that, that places like the district that I represent were Many of my, my neighborhoods were in crisis before the crisis. They were already um, pantries that were operating very close to capacity, if not over capacity. Um, and obviously it's gotten worse as many people have lost their jobs to the level, little level of stability that they had, they've lost. Um, so there's a couple of things. I know that there's, our, there's grab and go meals that exist at different schools all across the city. Uh, there is a, um, uh, where you can actually text just the word NYC food, so NYC F O O D, or Si habla español comida. So you text that uh, the number. Let me look for it for a second. It's eight seven seven eight seven seven. So if you text NYC food one word or comida to eight seven seven eight seven seven you'll be able to at least get a sense of what localities are close to you for grab and go meals. Um, and there's also uh, different resources in every district. I mean, my office has been working along with uh, churches, community centers um, to kind of facilitate, right? Cause it's, it's, uh, there's, it's the resources are on a, on a week to week basis. You know, we, we can tell you like places that you need to go. There's, pantries that operate every week uh, and folks, most folks already know about those, but contacting your, your elected officials office would be a good way to do it since there's resources that are particular to every neighborhood. And in certain neighborhoods, there have been community efforts that for, uh, for mutual aid that have popped up. Uh, and, and sometimes we give, we, we facilitate resources to those folks who are already members of the community and are doing some good work in identifying those in, in need. Um, so I would, so I would say, if you are in need, you can do those things. Look for resources that already that that are there from the city. Reach out to your local elected official. And this is very important. 
if you are a person, uh, and I certainly consider myself one of those folks who is privileged enough to be able to have a level of security, I have, I have a place to sleep, I know I'm going to be able to have a meal today, then you need to do a little bit more. Not only demand from government, as we are doing, that government needs to do more so that we can provide for all most vulnerable, but we as individuals should also do our part when we can. If we have some privilege, then we should use it. You know, I took my, uh, just as a quick example, the, so I was able to get that, the check from the, the federal money from the, you know, the, the, um, uh, the stimulus check, right, that they sent to everybody, so I qualified. And I got it, but then I actually gave it to different folks that actually needed for more than me, like gave it to a pantry and gave it to that. There's this, uh, there was this uh, online effort to identify like gig workers that were, you know, gigless during the height of the pandemic. So doing things like that. So I, because I didn't need it, I'm going to, you know, I have a salary, I'm good. So things like that, finding things that you can do if you are privileged enough to kind of help somebody else out, like do it. So those are, those are some of my suggestions. Assemblymember Reyes or Senator Kavanaugh, do you want to weigh in on this as well? No, I, I just say, first of all, I'm, I'm glad that Assemblymember Reyes identified this right at the top as a health issue. It is, it is absolutely critical if pe for people to maintain, you know, good access to nutritious food. Um, we've been pushing uh, to make sure that the you know, a lot of the governments are also making sure that the, the funds necessary to acquire the food is available. And, uh, you know, we push very hard in the budget uh, to maintain those funds. And, you know, as Senator Rivera said, a lot of the ability to deliver food or provide food through pantries is localized. Um, we have some terrific organizations working in Chinatown and the Lower East Side and in, in a lot of the neighborhoods in Brooklyn I represent. Uh, but you, you should you should be able to, during the pandemic in particular, get nutritious food delivered to your doorstep through an organization. Some of them are even very good at allowing you to choose what you would like to have delivered. Uh, so you should, you know, you should reach out. You should call 311 as a last resort as well and ask, or not, not as a last resort, you should call 311 and ask what resources are available where you live, but also as uh, Senator Vera mentioned, your local elected officials should be able to plug, we've all been working very hard on this issue and should be able to plug you into local resources uh, that uh, can help meet your needs as well. Uh, yeah, I also wanted to say that, you know, we, we've all been doing our own uh, individual work in our respective districts. Um, also the city has provided more funding for some of the exi existing pantries um, so we've had pantries in the community that perhaps used to serve a, a hundred folks now um, serve double that um, based on some, some funding that they've gotten from the city. And that has been incredibly helpful. Um, and, and also the community efforts that um, uh, Senator Rivera mentioned, a lot of mutual aid has, has uh, kind of uh, developed organically within the community. Um, to ensure that that everybody is is really um, getting everything they need, um, and you know, Gustavo gave his his stimulus money. I I was cooking for my building, uh, for some of the seniors in my building because I like to cook. If I cook, if I cook for anybody, it would be it would be harmful to them. So I did them a favor <laughs> by getting it to somebody who knew what the hell they were doing. I'm a good eater, not a good cooker. I just want to state that for the record. <laughs> Assembly Member Reyes, you're a member of the Education Committee in the Assembly, and uh, one of the, you know, uh, it, it seems to many people that, you know, the, the education system in New York, not that it's broken, but it's cumbersome. I mean, it, you have the Board of Regents, and then you have the State Education Department, the local districts, the local departments of education, and in our case, it, which governs both the public and non-public schools, in our case, at ADAPT, we have uh, in our preschools now, we have over 1,100 children throughout the city that we provide preschool services for. We are, in fact, you know, the, the voluntary sector here, unlike some places throughout the state as, uh, where they have BOCES and, and other uh, publicly funded, publicly operated programs. Uh, I'm wondering just what the work of the committee is, because one of the things that, that you know, we're, we're, we're constantly looking at, uh, at uh, you know, just how tight that is for, for us. And, and we're trying to, you know, we have, uh, and, and people don't always understand 
you know, the cost of preschool education, you know, which is rising. And of course the state right now, is not a good time to talk about increased dollars, but cost of education is rising. But at the same time, you know, we provide, uh, we provide needed access for uh, three and four year olds, particularly for therapy and through early intervention, which is more Senator Rivera's area. But the, uh, but, but just to talk generally about the work of the committee relative to uh, special education. Um, so I, I'm not a member of the, health, of the education committee, but I'm very versed in this topic because I'm, I'm a mom. sorry, <laughs> but it's okay. Um, so look, in, in terms of, uh, child, child care and, uh, early education, first there's, there's been this huge coalition that has been pushing for, um, reimbursement, um, and kind of a restructuring of that. Um, because we've seen that many of, many of these providers haven't gotten paid uh, during this time. There's been a delay in payments. Um, and that has, of course, been affecting how they deliver services to families. Um, but more importantly, uh, we've also seen that this hasn't necessarily been a priority for our state, um, ensuring that there is adequate child care and early, child, early education, early childhood development um, dollars for families that need it because it's either a single parent home or, or um, they uh, have childcare issues and parents work. But uh, I think it's important. I think it's important for families to, to know their rights particularly and know what services are there for them. Um, and and um, the state is required to provide free appropriate public education for children um, regardless of their disability, um, and, and to provide those accommodations as well. Uh, so uh, increasing funding for education has been one of the biggest issues um, that we've been struggling as state legis uh, legislators, um, and as fully funding our schools um, and fully funding services for um, early childhood education. And, and that has been a push because the governor isn't always necessarily um, on the same page as us. And uh, oftentimes he uh, presents an idea that he's looking to, to fully fund our schools, but um, really fully funding our schools means that we have to redo or, or completely change our education funding formula. Um, and that's something that the governor has not been willing to, to really address. And, and for us to have equitable funding throughout the state, we have to re, re address uh, our funding formula. Thank you. Uh, for all of you, the, right now we're, like many industries, we're in a crisis mode. Since 1974, um, people with developmental disabilities have been uh, funded well since the end of the Willowbrook era. And, uh, you know, throughout all the administrations, both Republican and, uh, and Democratic, as well as uh, both in the Senate and the Assembly, uh, there's been a concerted effort to ensure that individuals with developmental disabilities have both rights and access to housing, to training, to education, and, uh, and, and all the privileges and, uh, that, that we all, as members of the community, have. Uh, this past year, uh, you know, there is obviously the state of New York is in flux with its own budget, and there's no there's no way around that. There's no there's no there's no light at the end of the tunnel unless there's going to be aid to the state. The governor has correctly, I think, indicated that there's a uh, 15, 16 billion dollar budget gap, which uh, you guys are going to have to help him address as the as time goes on here. We'll see what happens. But I would challenge that a little bit. But go ahead with your question. Well. Well, it's significant. It, it, there's a significant budget gap in any event. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Right now, right now, the the, in our view, since since the onset of the pandemic, you know, we've we've closed day programs, and by and large, although some are opening up a little bit for members of, <coughs> pardon me, and you know, for a while, the the state was giving us, uh, uh, you know, retainer payments to to keep staff employed and to do things virtually and. Most of that is dried up. And as of October, just a, a biggest problem is that 
There are 35,000 folks with developmental disabilities living in group residences in the state of New York. Uh, Mr. Uh, Matthews, most- Mr. Matthews, I'm sorry to interrupt, but since I have to get off, I'm already five minutes late for my thing that I had to do at noon. I wanted to just address this really quickly. The challenge, we need help. <laughs> the, reason, the reason that I would challenge you a little bit is because I do not believe that the governor is correct. The governor is indeed talking about a significant budget deficit, and I don't doubt that we have that. But number one, the light at the end of the tunnel, we can have, you're right that we need and we must continue to demand federal assistance. And that is the light at the end of the tunnel. But guess what? There can be candles along the way, and those are called taxes for billionaires and millionaires. The revenue that we could get from the taxes that we must, we must, we must put on tax on billionaires and millionaires would actually give us added revenue to be able to better address those those cuts that we're talking about to be able to make sure that the cuts to the to to different services across the spectrum on health on social services on on education are lessened and the governor insists that he doesn't want to do that further there is a debate that we're having right now about money that we already got from the federal government and whether we could use some of this money to actually pay some of the contracts for services that have already been rendered. And the resistance to that, because we believe there's many of us in the, in the state legislature, I believe that both of my colleagues signed on to the letter and kind of joined this effort. Uh, I don't want to speak with them, obviously, but we believe that there is a way in the definition of this particular funding to be able to use it to pay back some of these services which have already been rendered. So I would say, as, as a last word for me, we need to continue to push. You should certainly push your local, your local elected officials, but you should put your efforts to focus on the governor because the governor is, saying, is not saying anything about taxing millionaires and billionaires. He's kind of dismissing the idea outright while he is asking all of you, all of you. to sacrifice further. And then on top of that, there is money that we already have from the federal government, which we could potentially use to put to pay for those services that have already been rendered. These are things that we must do because if we don't, and you can, you can actually fill in the blank on that because you are the folks that provide the services and you already know how challenged you are in providing those services. So the, I just wanted to, just for me, that would be my last word. Yeah, and, and right now, $238 million is being, as of October 1st is being taken out of the system. Uh, primarily by the uh, governor's budget office and OPWDD, which will restrict more access to people living in group homes, to access their community partners, to have people who have significant disabilities admitted to these residences because of cutbacks. And the fact of the matter remains is that we're being treated differently and worse than any other, uh, than any other, uh, than any other group. And and so both Senator Carlucci and Assemblymember Gunther, who lead the committees, have uh, have been uh, four square in their advocacy about that. So. I'm asking all of you to join them and us in the advocacy to try to do something about this because it's just unfair. And you know, every year when um, we do the budget hearings, um, because I'm chair of alcoholism and drug abuse, I sit on the table, I guess that they call it, with um, uh, mental health and OPWDD is included in those discussions and um, for the O agencies as they call them. And every year I, I try to grill Um, the commissioners and say, you know, we don't accept pat answers, you know, it's, it's, and we don't accept cuts. Of course, it's a battle. You know, I think there are various heroes in the legislature who take up the OPWDD and the other O agency battles, but we are constrained by what the governor's executive budget is and it's handed to us and we don't have really as much freedom as we would like to move uh, funds around. That's why lobbying beforehand is also very important. But yeah, it's true. Um, People with developmental disabilities and their families, and I know quite a few, um, they're worried about what's gonna happen with with their kids when they're gone. Um, And they're worried that the people who take care of their families don't get paid a a decent wage. So just when you have like a good rapport, sometimes the home worker leaves because, you know, they can get paid more. And unfortunately, sometimes they can get paid more, for example, in McDonald's than taking care of someone because the pay scale is so low and that is unconscionable. 
Um, I mean, what are we here for? We're here in government to make sure that everyone in society is taken care of. And the amount of money given to this area is certainly um, paltry compared to the needs. So um, we just have to keep fighting every single year. Um, and, you know, you guys are great at this with demonstrations and, and coming up to Albany and, and fighting, but it's really maybe, you know, I think what we are in the position we're in now, we have to tax multimillionaires and billionaires. And there's a host of bills for revenue raisers. Um, but we've, we've always seen things from the point of view of the haves. So we're afraid the people with money are gonna leave the city. So we don't want that to happen. Why don't we think about the people who will stay, have stayed, and have needs. Why aren't we putting their priorities first? Because we know that people with money, and this has been surveyed in the past, don't mind giving more. As a matter of fact, some, some have urged us to tax them. But the fact is that even if they're not so happy about it, they won't really even notice it because they have so much money. And I think it's really only the decent thing to do. I mean, Washington is in chaos. Um, who knows what's going to happen if we're going to have another stimulus package? One day it is and one day it's not. And, um, you know, the nonprofits who provide life-saving services and necessary services um, can't be the ones to bear the brunt of this terrible economy. And so, you know, that's part of my marching orders to myself that I go out there and fight for everyone who really can't sustain um, and absorb cuts when they've already been given so little in the first place. I mean, the governor also has this arbitrary 2% cap, right? Which the numbers, the, the initial deficit um, was subjected to, to fit within his 2% cap, which is, I think, one of the reasons why Senator Rivera was saying that he may not necessarily agree with the numbers that are projected from the governor's office on, on where we were in terms of our deficit and, and how we can raise the money um, to pay for the services the state needs. And maybe I'll jump in here just to say, um, so I, I agree and I've been a strong proponent of for a long time in raising taxes in a progressive way that will cause people who have made a lot of money, including many people who have made a lot of money during the pandemic. If you were invested in certain ways, you've done very well in the last six months, the last you know, four months as, as things have come back. Um, there is a lot of money we can generate by taxing people and we absolutely must uh, do that. Um, I will just, I just wanna add, uh, Gustavo started by saying and uh, that you know, the light at the end of the tunnel is federal uh, assistance as well. And I do wanna emphasize that that should not be assumed either in your advocacy efforts you should make a little time for advocating to your Congress members, to your, to your U.S. senators, um, to the White House if you have a relationship with, uh, if, you know, if you're inclined uh, to advocate in that way. Um, but, you know, we need the federal government to do a stimulus bill. It has been many, many months now. They allowed the pandemic unemployment to expire on July 31st which means many people who had been stabilized by that program lost that stability effective August 1st. Um, we need that, we need those programs to include money to stabilize the services that states and localities are providing that we're not, we're even, I'm very, ambi I'm very ambitious about taxing and progressively. Uh, we're not gonna generate all the money we need by taxes within New York state, just given how difficult the economy is. So we really do need the federal government to step up. They can spend, uh, in a deficit way, they can they can borrow and spend in a way that states can't, and they need to do that. And just one more particular plug: part of that effort needs to be rent relief. Um, we talked before about keeping the moratorium in place as long as necessary. And again, I am committed to the notion that nobody should get evicted because of COVID nineteen, uh, and for however long it takes. But at some point, as Assemblyman Reyes mentioned, the rent bills will become due one way or the other. And the way to address it, there are different models of that. One is to cancel the rent and then compensate the landlords. I've been focusing more on a proposal to just pay the rent outright, pay, pay tenants rent directly. 
Um, but either way, it's going to take billions of dollars. I think canceling the cancel rent bill is currently pushed by some of the tenant advocates, but actually costs substantially more. But in any case, it's going to take billions of dollars. And the federal government is well positioned to do that. We've been advocating for that kind of money since March. Uh, and it would be about $100 billion nationally, about $10 billion for New York would go a long way toward resolving that. That is a small amount relative to the trillions of dollars that the federal government has been giving out, a lot of it going to large businesses that don't necessarily even need it. So just don't assume the federal government, I think the federal government will act eventually and I think we'll get that money, but don't assume that, make that part of your advocacy strategy. But I agree also advocate to the governor and to your assembly member and your senator to make sure that tax increases on wealthy people are included in the way we dig our way out of this. You know, again, the governor has. We're asking the governor for his help here, not to, not to, not to attack him, but that, right. you know, that that this is a a very short-sighted decision with very long, long, long tentacles. I mean, now it'd be very difficult for a lot of a lot of agencies to, because of the way in which they're structured, to accept people with very challenging or 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 medical needs because they don't want to pay us anymore when someone's in the hospital, or when someone goes home, or does anything else. So. Uh, mm -hmm. These kinds, these kinds of efforts, I think, are very short-sighted, and uh, we just ask all of you to, to lend your voices to the uh, to the chairs of the committee. As you said, there's not much you can do with the governor's budget, but you can lend your voices to uh, to what he needs to do. Absolutely, and I hope uh, I am sure many of my colleagues um, are happy to do the same. Indeed, indeed. We'll thank all of you for your time and effort today, and for being not only friends to adapt its community network and its constituency, but to all vulnerable citizens in the in the state of New York. And thank you for your advocacy. We thank you for your work in the legislature. And we will certainly, I'm gonna turn this back to Kate, but again, I wanted to thank you for your time and effort today and for, for all of us uh, throughout the year. Kate? I second that. And I also wanna thank Edward Matthews for being our moderator for today's session. Uh, and also for all the viewers out there, if you um, have any questions that weren't covered in today's session, we would love for you to um, let us know. We have a survey that's available and you can put your questions in there and we'll reconnect with the elected officials and we'll get you responses to those questions. And, and thank you so much for participating in the plenary session and have a great rest of your day. Thank you to everybody. Thank you to my colleagues and thank, thank you, you to Adapt for, for doing this. It's been a great pleasure. Thank Thanks you, all. everyone.